everyone. I'm K.N. Smith, founder of Mental Health California and the director of Brother Be Well. Today, we're going to have a discussion about stigma in the African-American community and specifically how it affects families and individuals. And joining me today is our content director, uh, from Brother Be Well. This is Michael P. Coleman. He is responsible for driving our content and all of our videos, podcasts, and articles. And we're just fortunate and happy to have him with us today. We also are fortunate to have Michael Gant, who brings lived experience to our project. And he also works with NAMI Sacramento as a peer support coordinator and has interest in faith and mental health to help drive our program as well. We're also joined by Dr. Michael Houston. Welcome, Dr. Houston, who brings clinical experience to our project through his company, Treatment and Training Consultants. We also have the Vice President of the Capital City Black Nurses Association, and she is Cherie Cryer, and glad to have her with us today. And finally, we have Karen King with us, who is the secretary for the Capital City Black Nurses Association. So welcome everyone to our discussion about stigma in families and particularly African-American families and how this contributes to uh, a lack of awareness and uh, poor health outcomes and not to mention external factors, but self-stigma being a major problem for African-Americans with respect to mental health treatment. So we're gonna kick off our conversation uh, with a guiding question um, regarding uh, traditional uh, families and the conversations that they may or may not be having around uh, mental health, mental illness, especially for immediate families. Um, we, if we can open with Michael Gant, who brings lived experience to our project. Michael, um, what was your family situation and how did it deal with mental health? Well, initially, my, initially I, I, I came up in a, in, you know, in, in a traditional family, um, but the family disintegrated with the, with the loss of, of, of my mother and from that point on, the family we, we, the family took on a um, dysfunction, and we joined another family uh, who was who, who was dysfunctional as well. So things that I was dealing with, of course, I did not know um, were you know were, I was dealing with mental health issues. I just thought I was just dealing with things that I saw around in in in, in the neighborhood that I was living in and at the time. That was Hunters Point in San Francisco. So I saw a lot of things that I thought you know just was just the way things were. Um, Cause I came from a, I came from an area where, where, you know, where it was culturally diverse and I went to a, an all black um, community and, and schools as well. So that's when I started seeing, uh, seeing the differences with all um, black neighborhoods. And I, like I said, the things that I saw, I, you know, at first I was, uh, you know, I was alarmed and, and surprised. And then, you know, as I saw, as, you know, as I stayed there longer, I saw that it was, it was, it was normal. So, uh, you know, anyone with mental health issues, of course, we, we weren't addressed, weren't addressed at home, weren't addressed at school. Um, and for me, I never knew who I could go and talk to. So uh, things just kind of got, got out of hand from, from that point on. Do you think that a lack of awareness and a lack of resources at the time contributed to uh, your family situation and them just not being aware of mental health to even discuss it, as opposed to today where there's campaigns and a lot of awareness about mental health, not to mention social media. You think that those are contributing factors? I think it was it, it was it was a great contributing factor in, in, in that when I never re I was grown when I started hearing more, you know, more things about mental health. Um, and and how it how it affected uh, me, how it affected the black community, um, but it still at that at that time I, I wasn't really still wasn't aware that I was suffering from from, from more than one uh, symptom. Um, you know, of course later on when I found out, you know, I was quite relieved as far in you know, but as far as stigma, unfortunately, I still didn't have any experience with that when I was given my diagnosis. I would, you know, I wasn't stigmatized at all. I was relieved, and I started telling people about it from that time on. And I have been ever since. 
Well, thanks for sharing, Michael. We really appreciate that. And let's have an open discussion now about families and mental health. And I know that being a sibling of uh, an older brother who has schizophrenia wasn't the most open discussion in my family. Uh, and there were some uh, stigmatizing behaviors, uh, I would say, internally and also with people in our neighborhood and in the community. Um, so it's best to be open about it, but that's not always the case. So how about from our larger group here? Um, let's have a discussion about mental health stigma, particularly in black families. Um, I'll go ahead and share, um, especially uh, my generation in particular, uh, growing up in your formative years in the 80s and in um, specific neighborhoods that were impacted by drugs, that were a lot of single parent homes, um, and then also coming on the heels of the generations that what happens in this house stays in this house. Uh, boys don't cry. Um, be a strong black woman. All of these narratives that we have that shape how we think we should react to stress and trauma. But in reality, we're not dealing with or suppressing the feelings that we're going through of depression and anxiety um, and having suicidal ideation. So um, growing up at that intersection um, and then later becoming a healthcare professional, um, I, actually, I worked in um, mental health for about six years, um, just learning for myself how to unlearn some of those behaviors that were really ingrained and part of the norm, um, in addition to a religious household. So we're also going to church. So, you know, don't do anything else about mental health. You just go to church. We're going to pray it away. Um, and then you come home and you're like, well, I'm still sad and I'm still anxious, but I went to church and I'm praying. Um, so being of my specific generation, that is more um, vocal and, and reaching more for mental health now, there were a lot of narratives that from a very young age, and it's like, no, um, what happens in this house should be told to a professional if it is impacting you, if you are unsafe, if um, you need to have intervention, if you need to be diagnosed, there's options. Um, but those conversations just weren't had. You were either fine or you were crazy. Um, and no one wanted to be, um, you know, we, or we all had a family member that was suffering from mental illness in one way or another. And it's, oh, that's just your crazy aunt so-and-so, your crazy cousin. And um, so you didn't even want to be um, described in that same way because they ridicule this family member, right? So even if you and your aunt or your cousin were having some of the same um, symptoms or experiences, it wasn't really well received to discuss it widely because you don't want to be labeled. And that's the power of stigma. Like you can be so scared to be labeled as someone else that you don't speak up to share what you're actually going through. So I'm excited to see how um, the younger generations are having more access to mental health and they're removing the stigma. Um, in fact, I have two teenage daughters and they tell me how they feel all the time. And my response to them is always, I didn't have feelings. <laughs> I, was like, I, was like, I feel like I never told my mom I felt any type of way. But my kids, will they'll say I'm mad, I'm upset, I'm disappointed. I'm worried about this. I, I never had those thoughts. Like I could not have feelings. So I think it's uh, we're moving in the right direction uh, because they don't have the same uh, point of view about the stigma that my generation and previous generations have. You, you know, that's, I just want to jump in on that too. I think that uh, I share some of that same, um, some of the same, I guess, philosophies growing up. Whereas with our family, we, uh, you know, you, you didn't talk to the public because we, you didn't trust CPS, you didn't trust um, basically civil servants whatsoever. The only way that you really uh, spoke to anyone was listening in the church if you went to the church and so you could get your life's lessons from the church uh, but even then too it was it wasn't necessarily addressing the mental health it wasn't really addressing the issues it was a form of counseling but it really wasn't a form of talking with you directly and so in the home there was, you know, uh, there was domestic violence. There was uh, uh, family members who uh, uh, were, were confused about their gender, identi uh, gender identity. There was uh, uh, just uh, substance abuse, all of those different things. And nobody really trying to address it, but the elephant is in the room. 
and nobody really wants to uh, or feel safe to talk to each other about it. So it wasn't until much later um, for me, as far as joining the military, I had to just get away and um, uh, a, a means of coping with it was through sports. So I know growing up, uh, because all of that was, um, I guess uh, the word would be uh, suppressed in, and so there was a lot of anger. And so through the sports, that was a vehicle to unleash that frustration, those feelings. And as a result, I think particularly with African-American culture, um, that's where you have so much success um, at least, at least for for my case, it was it was a means of hey venting out all of that frustration, all of that uh, neglect, all of that hurt, all of that resentment through sports, and then um, um, coming back and after going to the military, even within the first year, after coming back and looking at the community, looking coming home, I had said that I was going to do some some basic things like. Uh, hug, you know, hug my family when I see them. We didn't have that kind of uh, of of love in the house or even just telling the family members, hey, I love you. And so coming back and intentionally sharing those things or doing those things, it even felt awkward to hug my mom when that just wasn't part of the household. We had to be strong. Men didn't cry. Um, you had to produce, you had to be uh, be the man. And so those kinds of things, um, you know, stigma or basically uh, kind of hardwired you. But at the same time, being able to leave and then come back and look at it and make some changes just started started the, uh, the healing process. Yeah, I am. Um... I kind of going along the lines of what you both touched on. Um, I saw a meme like online that kind of summed it up is why uh, does black and brown families believe in like bad luck and uh, ghosts, but we don't, we fail to recognize mental health. And I think similar to like um, what was touched on by Sheree is we do kind of sweep it under a rug. And uh, we learned about a lot of this in school with alcoholism, which is not very unique. Um, to just the African-American or minority population where the family kind of covers it up. We all kind of group around and make sure that no one outside the house knows what's going on. Um, so that is like one of the biggest deals with uh, mental health issues. I think um, going back to a strong black woman or a strong black man, um, we try not to uh, acknowledge it because we think that people see it as more of like a de developmentally delayed thing going on um, and not just like more of a, just a mental health issue. I you know, kind of, going back to uh, where, where I come from, I'm a, you know, you know, a, a different generation. When I did see a lot of issues in my family, but of course at the time I couldn't, you know, I couldn't understand, you know, what they were. I had a brother who committed suicide. Um, but it, yeah, I wasn't around. I was by this time I was in the military. I was you know, I was in another country, um, and, and there was years um, that anybody else in the family decided to tell me some of the things that went on with with my brother and the, you know, to find out that he was addicted to to heroin, um, and, and you know, and it just had a, had an episode and ran out, and then he found his body in, in the San Francisco Bay. Um, that, that again, that again was swept under. I mean, as big as it was, you know, no, no, nobody in the neighborhood truly knew what, what how he ended up there. So, you know, because it was all about keeping his memory alive, you know, keeping a good, good memory. He was a good, he was a good kid. You know, he, you know, he, you know, he worked hard, you know, and then he played hard and, 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 and it got him. And, you know, but for, for me, I can, I can go back and I can look on things and I can see that some of the things that I was dealing with, um, having been sexually abused, having been mentally abused by, by parents, you know, um, thinking, well, I, you know, how am I, am I going to get away from all this? And, and, and that's when I, that's when I decided to go into the military and I actually went in twice, um, always looking for a better way. And, 
you know, for a long time, not finding it now, you know, but I was, you know, I was always functional. I was, you know, and I was, I was always, I was always successful to a point until, and, and, and you know, until I lost purpose after having been forcibly forced to leave the military. Honorably, though, 